almighty God. Oh, Lord, we glorify your name. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated this morning. We get started. Don't forget. Uh, if you if you have any unfinished business at the hotel, whether you, you know, rented a, a movie, you know, got a massage, whatever the case may be, don't leave that with the church. Amen. Pay your fines, pay your bills before you leave. Don't steal any towels. Don't do anything that brings a bad report to the Amarillo Church. Can we say amen? Also, don't forget, prayer tonight is at 6. Pastor Teshma is coming to, to bring the Holy Ghost for us tonight at 7. Be here for that. Amen. Do you see somebody at, 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 at eating out? Invite them out tonight. Tell them this is it's going to be a great time that God can change their life. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So let's give God a, a praise and, and glory as Pastor Anthony comes and preaches this morning. Praise God. Amen. It's good to be here and definitely always a privilege to minister in our harvesters. Amen. Uh, and more importantly, in my mother church. Amen. Um, uh, just the tremendous amount of people that I've known through the years and that have been here uh, to see you faithful, and that's a wonderful blessing. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn them with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 8. Um, I want to minister out of this message. I'll give you a little time to get there. Uh, and uh, really had this message on my mind. And, you know, it kind of seems like many of you that I, I've preached in many of the churches, uh, Oklahoma, and, and uh, you know, I, f I find myself preaching uh, a lot about uh, brethren and the church. And uh, it's going to be somewhat similar this morning, but I... I really believe that uh, God always takes me in this direction. And uh, uh, just reading up on some things, you know, we heard Pastor Mike this morning talking about the military. My father was in the military. Uh, there's a lot of amazing stories about uh, rescues and, and heroes. And, and, but one of the, the, the areas of, of what, you know, our country has that really stuck with me and started reading up on this was the U.S. Coast Guard. And uh, in the U.S. Coast Guard, they, there is known uh, people that are called, or the people that work for the U.S. Coast Guard, one of them are helicopter uh, rescue swimmers. And uh, they have a creed, and in this creed, this is what it says, it is my duty as a pararescueman to save life and to aid injured. I will be prepared at all times to perform my assigned duties quickly and efficiently, placing these duties before personal desires and comforts. These things I do so that others may live. And it was interesting to me, began to read about uh, some of these stories and some of the uh, uh, men, amen, that are involved with this. Uh, you know, it, it's just tremendous. One of these men uh, that... that uh, that um, is spoken about that is in the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, it was interesting to me to read his his bio, and it, it was a this was back in the 1800s. Uh, uh, this man, a man, uh, he had the, literally on, under the title of his life saved a thousand souls. And um, what was interesting to me is that. This is back in the 1700s, mind you, amen, uh, 1790, 1800s, uh, that this man who joined the, this uh, rescue swimmers, the U.S. Coast Guard, it started when he was a young boy. And he is there on the coast. His parents are coming in on a boat. Uh, and I mean, not too far off in the distance, this uh, uh, wave takes that boat out and it kills. He sees his family die in his eyes. And he's, he's only about six years old at the time. And from that moment on, a burden was placed in him. From that moment on, a necessity, a need that stuck with him. And so from that point on, in fact, it says that this man ended up uh, uh, all the way up into, I think it was his late 70s, uh, was out saving people, amen. And one time he, he did it continuously for 
over 36 hours uh, just saving people uh, uh, as much as he can, going out, loading them on a little boat, bringing them back, going back out. Uh, and uh, all the way up into his, I think it was late 70s, 80s, uh, he dies, and where he dies is literally on the shore. He falls dead on the shore. And the last thing he said was, I served what my passion was. And I began to think about that. And I want to minister this morning on a sermon that I've entitled, So Others May Live. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 through 33. Let's look at what the Bible says. The Bible says these words. Here is Jesus. He's foretelling his death and resurrection. And in verse 31, the Bible says these words. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Now, I was battling on, the, on, on my scripture for the text, and uh, I believe God gave me this for a reason, because in this scripture... Uh, we can find that Jesus is describing and he is bringing in, amen, the purpose of his calling. He is, he is laying that upon the men that he is discipling, the men that he is investing in, the men that he has rescued from their life of sin. How many are following me? He's demonstrating what, what God's call for his life is, and he's placing it upon these men. And so what I want to look at first and foremost uh, is that I want to look at the definition of what drives the will of God for Jesus in this moment. Think about this. It is the understanding of what God's love is. Is. You and I are in this place here this evening. We've, we've heard it preached, amen, uh, uh, in different areas, different uh, of the men that have kind of touched on this. Uh, uh, that, uh, amen, uh, love of God is different from what the world defines love. Uh, uh, love of, of, you know, our, our understanding is uh, that, you know, we love people that love us. How many know what I'm talking about? Uh, that if people are, treat us right, uh, hey, we'll treat them right. Uh, but you see, the definition of God's love is is that you love them despite how you're treated. That God's love says that when you can give me nothing, my love moves me to still lay down my life for you. Think about that for a moment. God's definition of love, amen, is that in this scripture are men that he is literally rescued, men that he is pulled, men that he loves, men that he's investing in, men that he's, he's placing the weight and the burden of his ministry. He is sharing to them, listen, I am here and I'm going to be brutally, amen, executed. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be tormented by the religious leaders. And in this moment, of investment, in this moment of involvement into their lives, they couldn't see his love. I want you to think about this for a moment. This task is always going to be about others. Always. His main focus was the sake of others that they may live. You look at his ministry, the Samaritan woman. You know, I can't remember. My, my daughter, Allison, was showing me uh, one of the, um, it's one of those uh, uh, Christian uh, shows where they take parts of, I can't remember for the life of me the name of it, uh, uh, where they take the stories of the Bible and they, and they make it into a, 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 a movie, or not a movie, a, a series or something like that. The Chosen, maybe. Chosen, yes. Okay, and so one of them, it was about this, uh, you know, the, the, the Samaritan woman. And when you understand this, let, let's be honest, we read the Bible, and one of the worst things we can do is we take the human aspect out of what we're reading. 
Okay, here is a woman, and just to give you an understanding, here is a woman that has been, uh, you know, uh, we know that she's, uh, you know, she's sleeping around. Uh, we understand in the Bible, yeah, what a, you know, what a, what a, what a floozy, right? What, but but in, in, in the eyes of Jesus, here's a woman that has been rejected. Here's a woman that doesn't want to be even tolerated. Here's a woman that is belittled, that is even, even not even considered. A woman, amen, who is an outcast, that has a testimony and a reputation, not even dealing with the torment of demon, uh, demonic uh, uh, involvement in her mind. Dealing and battling with perhaps even uh, suicidal thoughts. Rejected and shunned. Nobody likes feeling that way. But can you imagine, amen, how many times with her? Yet Jesus' love moves him to a well, a Samaritan well, to meet this one woman and to say, listen, I am here so that you could live. I have left this other place so that I can meet you at a place and tell you you don't have to live this way. And at that moment of that, that, that encounter, a transformation upon this woman's life happens. Going back to our text, these disciples, these men, there was an, another one that my daughter had showed me, and it's talking about Peter and, you know, we, we understand where Jesus pulls him and he preaches off of the boat. How many remember? He says, hey, cast your net on the other side. Some of you may have seen this. But, you know, what? I never even stopped to think about the situation that could have been happening. You know, it, it wasn't like, oh, we went out there, we fished, we didn't catch Jack, you know, bummer, you know. What? No, uh, when you stop and think, you know, they were fishing for a reason. And the reason why they were fishing is because they perhaps had to bring food to the family. They had to pay their taxes. And so that brings it out on this, on this little story that here is Peter, and he's trying his best because the taxes were being risen. He can't meet this. He needs a whole amount of money to cover this. Uh, otherwise, he's going to be in the hands of the Romans. Uh, amen. And, and the leaders are going to look at him. And so here he is, and he toils and toils uh, and nothing. And the way it portrays is, now listen to me. I, I understand it's a film, but I, I'm trying to bring the human aspect to this. He comes after catching nothing. And the only thing that could probably, if you've ever known what I'm talking about, and you feel in a hopeless situation, you can understand what I'm talking about. Like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And as he pulls up to the shoreline, here is Jesus, right? And he's preaching. And then he looks at him and says, hey, there's so many people. Can I use your ship? Now, let's, once again, really, I had a bad day. Right? We all get them bad days. But he, he allows him to, and then he teaches him a lesson. And he says, listen, cast your net on the other side. And, and we under that, understand the story and the dynamic of the miracle. But I think what we forget is that the response of the miracles of Jesus were oftentimes to meet the needs of people that were needing saved. Those of you that are sitting here this morning, God saved you from a sinful life. <laughs> Listen. In a moment of need. In a moment of need. I was talking to Brother Ray before coming, and, I, and I'll move on here in just a second, but I was talking to Brother Ray uh, right before the break, and I just had to ask him a question, because when we first got into Amarillo, uh, this was, um, you know, years ago, and Brother Ray was, you know, was saved. Pastor Sean, we just heard Pastor Sean preach. Pastor Sean was in and out. And you've heard, you've heard Pastor say this. He was a uh, tobacco-spitting Baptist, right? <laughs> you know, and I, I remember Pastor Sean walking in on Buchanan Street. I remember him walking in, you know, and, 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 and you know, just, I, I can remember. I remember him. I, you know, I remember his life. And, and, and through the process, listen to me, of, of not only salvation, someone bringing him to church, but the investment of pastor into his life salvaged him. 
And when you look at what God has done with that miracle, then you look at Oklahoma City, Brother Scott, Brother Ray, listen to me, Brother Billy, you look at the, the choir the last night, that because of one man's investment into his life, the miracle of transformation. So that others may live. Think about this. So others may live. The love of Christ is not dependent on whether they are appealing to you, uh, whether they're, you know, you're comfortable around them. Uh, the love of Christ says, despite what you think it is, uh, I love them just as well. If we're honest here this morning. How many people do we walk past? Because in our mind, it's a waste of time. You, you could see it through the course of Jesus' life. We, we had the privilege of going into Branson uh, and, and seeing um, uh, uh, the Jesus play. One of my favorite parts, if you've ever seen that, hey, I'd highly encourage you to see it. It was amazing. But one of the things that really put a knot in my throat is when they, they do the, the, the act of where Jesus pulls up to, you know, this wicked place called the Gadarene. And there is a demon-possessed man. And Jesus steps off the boat. And if you know anything about the scripture, the Bible says there were plenty of others that were demonically possessed. Think about it for just a moment. It wasn't just the one. Yet this man comes and encounters Jesus and delivers him on the spot. That Jesus was willing to meet this man. Why? Because he was probably asking to be free. If you know anything about deliverance, you, you have to know this. That you, can, you can want someone to be free all you want, but unless they want to be free, it ain't going to happen. Jesus showed up there. Why? Because I believe that that man says, I need help. If you look through the history of scriptures, the scripture shows us that Jesus said he uses the example of, of, of leaving the 99 for the one. That his heart and his love is demonstrated in people that could do nothing for him. And we understand that. I, many of you in this place, you've been saved for a while. You understand outreach and witnessing. Hey, you understand our ministries isn't so that we can have spotlights on us, right? You, you understand that in your mind. You know it's, oh, it's about souls, every testament, right? It's about souls. But let me ask you truly and honestly, is it really? When it comes to your walk with God, is it really? Going back to our text, these are the men that Jesus had his hands on. These are the men that Jesus has rescued. These are the men that Jesus has uh, you know, uh, is, is investing uh, destiny and, 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 and ministry. His love saw the need for healing. His love saw the need for restoration. You know what else his love saw? The potential of what God can do in the sinner's life. Let me tell you something here this evening. We are a part of a unique fellowship that says you may not have it all together. You may not have a high school diploma. But I could see what God could do with your life. You know why? Because God's love says this, that he'll use the foolish to confound the wise. And I'm going to touch on that here in a little bit. But I want you to listen to me here this morning. This is what the love of Christ is. This is what brings the love of Christ. That it's not in how you are treated or not how you view people, but God's love flows to everyone. Here's where I want to look at very quickly. 
is that it's not only for the sinner. That God's love should pour into how you treat your brothers. I want you to think about this for a moment. The task is not only for the sinner, but also for the brother. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Now, think about this for a moment. This is the verse after the conference scripture, right? Here is the theme. Hold fast. But the verse following that scripture says this. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I've been battling this in my mind, praying, God, it seems like every time I preach, I, I'm always moving to how the church is functioning as a body. And I'm saying, God, listen, you know, but it always brings me to that. And, and in this text, I couldn't help but God shining a spotlight saying, you know, one of the worst things that happens that, that will fight against God's love is when brethren start, you know, uh, fighting against each other. When they start, uh, amen, uh, uh, looking at each other, the love of God goes out the door because it's only based on how I'm treated. And let's be honest. Selfishness is always the, the battle against love. Love is giving. Love endures. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It doesn't boast. Love is, is it, it doesn't matter what others are doing. The love of God that lives in me reminds me that I was unfit for his forgiveness. How many times did I say no to that church? How many times have I accused the church? Yet he was willing to not forget about me. I was talking to, to Brother Ray, as I mentioned, and I didn't know this, honestly, but one of the person or one of the people that Brother Ray witnessed, witnessed to when he first got saved was Brother Jimmy Lucero. And what was funny is that when Jimmy got saved, Right? He came in, got saved, and then he heard people praying in tongues, and he panicked and freaked out and left for a little while. And if I got the story right, I, I think Ray ended up running into him again and saying, listen, you need to come home. And Jimmy came back and has been in the church for over 20-some years. Back in the 1900s, many of you may know a well-known baseball player by the name of Shoeless Joe Jackson. He played for the Chicago White Sox. He had a 356 career batting average. In fact, this, this average was the third highest in the history of Major League Baseball. But what's interesting about this man is that he's only known by something he participated in. This man had a potential like none other. He, he was a man that had, uh, you know, the ability to, uh, he was an outfielder. He, he was just amazing in what he did. Uh, but what happened was, uh, this was around uh, 19, uh, if I got it right, 1933 or so, or no, excuse me, 1920, right around there. Uh, uh, he got involved with the scandal that labeled the Chicago, Chicago White Sox as the Chicago Black Sox. And what it was is that there were eight men involved, and what they did is they were gambling to uh, uh, rig the game. And so here he is. He's involved in this scandal. Eight men. They were on their way to the World Series. If you know the story, they ended up losing two of those games. Eight men. But what, what happened was, is they were thrown out of baseball completely. They were never allowed to go back into baseball. People protested. It was a well-disputed, uh, you know, argument that, hey, uh, you know, they need to at least, there should be some leniency, some grace. Uh, 
amen, but the, the commissioner at that time uh, uh, said no. They are banned for life. And so people, of course, put up statues of Shoeless Joe Jackson and, and all that, and there was some remembering, but he never again got to play the game. One of the final moments of his life in 1933, he had opened a barbecue uh, little restaurant, and I guess it didn't take off. But his last thing that he opened was a liquor store. And a gentleman by the name of Ty Cobb walks in. If you know who Ty Cobb was, uh, he, uh, he uh, played, uh, he was nicknamed the Georgia Peach, uh, and he played center field uh, back in those days when, when uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson played. Uh, but he played for the Detroit Tigers. Well, him and a sports writer named uh, Grantland Rice walk into his liquor store. And here is Joe Jackson. He doesn't show that he notices them, no sign of recognition whatsoever. And after making his purchase, Cobb finally asked Jackson, don't you know me, Joe? And Jackson replied these words. He says, sure, I know you, Ty. But I wasn't sure you wanted to know me. A lot of them don't. You're sitting here this evening. One thing that's inevitable is that you're going to have to serve God with people. You're going to have to serve God with imperfect people. Pastor Sean said so profoundly uh, that no one can destroy you more than yourself. It's inevitable. You have to serve God with people. We all have Ray Voskuses in our churches. <laughs> The iron that sharpeneth the iron. Amen. <laughs> Lord knows we need that iron. You know why? Because it reminds you, God, this is why I need to be saved. I want you to listen to me. This is what I want to look at secondly. Is that this love has to extend, extend to the brethren. And I want you to hear me out for a few moments. Here is Jesus in our text, and this is what stuck out to me. He's, he's, again, he's rescued these men from sin. He's discipling them. He wants to place the calling upon their life, right? And he's sharing to them not only God's plan for what he's gonna, about to go through, the weight. Right, uh, uh, the burden, and, and, and the way I look at it is that perhaps even in his own ministry, just the support of the men that he's investing in to say, oh, we're going to be there for you. But you know what the Bible says? That as he shares this, Peter pulls him aside and begins to rebuke him. But that's not what stuck out to me. The Bible says that Jesus looks back and sees the other disciples. And then he looks at Peter and he says, get thee behind me, Satan. He uses a rebuke that Jesus literally used for Satan himself upon Peter. And it brought a, an interesting thought. I want to look at, secondly, the need for friendship and brotherhood. It's not a game. It's not a cliché. Souls are important to God. Whether they're the sinner on the street or the brother and sister inside the church, God values the individual. And I believe what Jesus saw was the influence of a brother. And that influence had spread, whether it was Peter influencing or Peter was the spokesman of the influence. Either way, there was an impact that fought against the love and the will of God in Jesus' life. And Peter brings it to Jesus. And Jesus says, you are being used by Satan. The call of God should not be hindered by the church. How is it? Well, let's talk about brotherhood and friendship. What about carnality at its best? You know, if any of you know the history of autoimmune diseases, there's a list of them. What autoimmune diseases are is that it's when your body begins to attack the healthy 
cells itself. That it, it can't decipher, right? It's like a mass confusion. And all of a sudden what happens is your own body starts to kill you. It starts to attack the healthy cells. It starts to, uh, you know, uh, deteriorate the ones that are trying to bring healing into the body. We had a brother, we have a, we have a brother in our church. And, and I'll use him later on in the example, and he's here tonight or this morning. But he just had a transplant, a kidney transplant. And our brother, amen, he, uh, uh, to, to get that, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing story. But what, what was interesting is that his kidneys were not functioning, so our brother could not drink very much. What happened is that instead of your body uh, flushing it out, and his weren't working. And so what happened is that he would have to go. We, we actually went on a vacation with some of the church folks uh, into California, and uh, uh, he had missed one of his dialysis treatments. And, and, uh, and so, you know, what happened is his body began to swell because he's retaining the fluids. And so in order to com combat that, he couldn't drink anything for a day or two until he had those released. And so think about this. Autoimmune diseases, that, that's, that's similar to the church. There's a direction. There's a vision. There, there's a place. It's God's love being preached and demonstrated. But within the body, yeah, it's killing each other. Within the body, you got, you got sinful carnality. Uh, amen. Uh, uh, I don't know. Misery loves company. Uh, they gather together. Uh, and what do they do? They start to attack the righteous. Oh, you know, oh, they're always, you know, always got something to do. You know, always got something. And it begins to, listen, uh, any righteous Christian that has a knowledge of God should be able to recognize carnality. It flows from the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. When they start talking about a brother, that's not of God. When they start diminishing in their ministries, when they start backing off, that's not of God. God says you give all. The love of God moves you to give all. And every righteous Christian should know that. But what happens? The body begins to attack the body. There is a need for brotherhood. There is a need for friendship. There's a, there's a poor, uh, John chapter 15, verse 12 through 14. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. There's a point in Elijah's life, if you remember this, where Elijah goes into the wilderness, he left his servant behind in Beersheba. He was alone. And God knew this was not good. God gave him a man by the name of Elisha. And so if you know this, here is Elijah, and he's misery and uh, feeling like I just want to die. And you know the story, uh, amen. And so here is this scripture, and what was interesting to me is it here is the concluding words of, of the chapter of where this is dealing with and ministered unto him. God, God speaks to him. And it was interesting to me. He gave him, uh, you know, a, a person, a confidant uh, to, to walk with, a friend, a peer, a disciple, a support. And in verse 15 and 16, God tells Elijah to meet three people. The first one is God puts this man in his life is the word says that he was ministered to. It means to attend to, to contribute to, to serve. This describes the kind of friend that Elisha was to Elijah. You know what God says? Wait, before you meet all these other people, you need to go get your friend. Because you ain't thinking straight. You need to go talk to that friend. Now, here's where, what happens within the body of Christ. Some of you are friends with ungodly. Some of you are friends with carnality. Some of you are friends with unfaithful. That's not what the scripture is referring to. God says you need to go back to the man that thinks like you, that acts like you, that responds like you. There is a need for brotherhood. There is a need for friendship. You know, I, 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 I pastor a church in a city where there's multiple churches. At one point, we had five churches in our city. And you know what always vexed me the most? Is the battle of confines. The battle of, 
the, the, that's mine, and that's, you know, it, it, that bothers me to no end. Here you have men laboring for this so that someone can live, being killed by a brother because you've crossed my line. God help us. God, God help us. Don't tell me it's about others me living because it's about you living. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. That's selfishness at its best. That's not the love of Christ. It's not the love of Christ. Brotherhood and friendship says we do this together. The purpose is winning the city. You win the city. You win the city, you can win another city. It comes in your heart to God. It comes in your convictions. I, I just have a hard time when you see people want to do something for God and they're killed by a brother. They're, 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 you know, a brother gets up to preach for the first time. They're given the investment and, and, and right away, amen, uh, people ready like, man, that was stupid what you said. Like, seriously? Like, Seriously? Can I preach to pastors for just a moment? I usually don't preach to pastors. It's usually a broad statement for the congregation. But can I, can I preach to my brothers here this morning? Our success is dependent about, uh, on the unity of discipleship. It's dependent on your brotherhood. You, you cannot survive flying solo. How can you stand up and preach and neglect the brotherhood yourself? The Bible says the devil, a roaring lion, an example. What does he do? He looks for the one. He looks for the lagger. He looks for the one that's behind. Really? You're going to preach that to the church when you yourself are isolated? When you yourself can't even call for wisdom? Or you yourself can't even call for encouragement? You know, I mean, we're good at calling for our encouragement. But when was the last time you called to encourage your brother? Why? Because selfishness always combats God's love. I can tell you, there's, there's a for sure counting on. Pastor Sean. May not be in a month. But I can tell you, I can for sure get a call from my brother. Sup, my brother. I can count on it. And in the house of God, it becomes like what happened in our text. Is it the weight of God's ministry upon Jesus? Even the relief of burden upon his life could have been ministered to by these men. Can you imagine? They said, you know what, Jesus, the, the, the price you're going to pay for our lives, what can we do to be a blessing to you? Can you imagine? It could have probably gave him the encouragement to say, hey, we, we can do this. And we know it's Jesus in your mind again. You pull out the human aspect, right? Well, that's Jesus. He's got to do it anyways, right? No, no, no. The Bible shows us when he's there praying in the garden and he, he's sweating drops of blood and he's saying, God, listen, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. And if it's possible, please take my life. And out, I, I preached on this, I think the last harvest was right, outside the men, it, the disciples, the investment are asleep. And slowly affecting the ministry of God. A horrible thing to see. I'll never forget a story. I'm going to move on to the third point here very quickly. But I'll never forget a story of a brother of ours. He's a pastor. And I, I know I may have shared this in, in uh, you know, some of the churches. It's hard to tell anymore. Amen. But here's a pastor that is just trying to do his ministry. Song service team rebels, walks off the stage because he's dealing with sin, compromise. And so here he is struggling. Song service isn't what it used to be. They were musicians. They were good. 
And so his own son says, Dad, I'll do it. I'll jump on the drums. He gets on the drums and begins to play, and not the best, not as good as it used to be. But the misery that loves company are now together in a pack. Right? And here is this young teenage boy, mind you, teenage boy, that are being laughed at from the audience, pointing. Yeah. Had nothing to do with what they chose to do, yet killing him. Listen to me, that's not of God. Autoimmune disease can affect the body of Christ. And that's what Jesus, I believe, noticed when he looked at the disciples. He said, listen, this isn't just one of you. But you've been infected. You've been influenced. And now you're used by Satan. You're being used by Satan against my call of God. I wonder how many sitting here this morning, you're in the church, but you're being used by Satan to fight against your pastor. Haughtiness, and pride, arrogance, those are none of the characteristics of God's children. Characteristics of, of a Christian is humility. Compassion, kindness, so others may live. I'm going to look at, thirdly, as I prepare to close. There was a village in Eam. This was in England about 1665, and what had happened was that it was, many of you may remember this in history, the Black Plague that went in and it, it just uh, sweeping across Europe, killing people on a scale never seen before. This spread was caused by fleas. And a bale of damp cloths arrived to this little town of Eam from London to a local tailor. And when the tailor hung out the damp cloths to dry, fleas were unintentionally freed and infected in the village. The tailor himself dies a few weeks later alongside 42 other villagers. There were approximately, at that moment, 800 villagers at that time. And the first instinct is what we all know is fight or flight, right? So the first instinct is, is that we got to leave, right? It's only natural, man. We better get out of here because this isn't a joke. And so here is this first thing that happens. The town is starting to get... Uh, you know, uh, unsettled. And so a man by the name of William Moppison convinced the entire village, he was a pastor, believe it or not, that you know what, it's our duty to stay in order to stop the spread the, the, uh, the neighboring villages. The entire village agreed, and by 1666, despite every family being affected in some way, not to mention the fear of who might be lost, they remain there quarantined. Now, we all know about quarantine. Amen. Acts of heroism are quite often seen throughout history, referring to a person or even a small group of people. But rarely do you see an entire village willing to sacrifice himself to save others. That should be an example of the church so that others may live. Put away the pettiness. Put away the things that are so minimal. Well, she didn't say hi to me, so I'm not going to say hi. And can I just say this? Young teenage girls, you're the worst. <laughs> you are the worst. The drama queens of this age. Pettiness. There's a need for brotherhood. I, I read this about Abraham Lincoln, and this was interesting to me too. 
this was from the, the Civil War, and it, and it talks about the need for him and friendship. And during the worst days of the Civil War, there was an old friend of Abraham Lincoln's at Springfield, Illinois, a, a shopkeeper named Billy Brown. And he decided to travel to Washington to see his old friend, the president. An aide to the president asked him if he had an appointment. No, sir, replied Billy. I ain't and I ain't necessary. Maybe it'll all right be fitting, he said, to have appointments, but I reckon Mr. Lincoln's old friends don't need an appointment. The, the receptionist says, well, I'll tell him there, Mr. Brown, that you are here. And so the aide frowns and goes, and in about two minutes, the door popped open, and out came Mr. Lincoln, face aglow. Billy, he said, pumping his friend's hand, now I am glad to see you. Come right in. You're going to stay at supper with me and Mary. As soon as Mr. Lincoln could discharge his immediate responsibilities, the two men went to the back of the house, sat down on the stoop, and as Billy later put it, talked and talked. He asked me about pretty nigh everybody in Springfield. I just let loose and told him about the weddings and the births, the funerals, the buildings, and I guess there wasn't a yarn I hadn't threaded. Three and a half years it had been away, I didn't spin for him, he said. Laugh, you would ought to hear him laugh. Just did my heart good, for I could see what they'd been doing to him. Always was a thin man, but lordy, he was thinner than ever now. His face was kind of drawn and gray, enough to make you cry. Late that evening, Billy said goodbye. The president tried to get him to stay the night, but Billy, not wanting to impose, declined. As they parted, Lincoln said, Billy, wait. What would you come down here for? Billy looks at him and says, I came to see you, Mr. Lincoln. But you ain't asked me for anything, Billy. What is it? Out with it. No, Mr. Lincoln, I just want to see you. Felt kind of lonesome, been so long since I'd seen you, and I was afraid that I'd forgot some of them yarns. If I didn't unload them soon. Lincoln gazed into his friend's eyes. Do you mean to tell me you came all the way from Springfield, Illinois, just to have a visit with me? That you ain't got no complaint in your pockets or advice up your sleeves? Yes, sir, that's about it. Tears immediately came down Lincoln's eyes and ran down his cheeks. He says, I'm homesick. Billy, just plumb homesick. And it seems as if this war would never be over. Many a night I can see the boys dying on the fields and can hear their mothers crying for them at home, and I can't help it. Billy, you'll never know just the good that you've done to me. Friendship. It's not about arguing your points. It's not about being right. It's not about staying on here. Who has the biggest church? Who has the more men? It's about your relationship with each other. And Jesus recognized that in these men. And he sees the ungodly influence. And he says, this is Satan. It doesn't want anything to do with God. It hinders the calling. It frustrates the will of God. I close so that others may live. This is a statement from the rescue swimmers of the U.S. Coast Guard. As I was reading this out and I was studying this, here are men, some of them, a lot of them are married men. And I want to explain to you the value of this because this is profound to me. That when you talk to these coastmen, they have this, they call it, um, I don't know if it's a phrase or their motto, if you will, it's called the long blue line. I want you to listen to this. This is what they say. This is their, their quotes and their, what they live by. I wouldn't say anyone joins the Coast Guard to be heroes. 
said Petty Officer Lauren Laughlin, United States Coast Guard Academy Public Affairs Officer. I think the fact that we join proves there is a long blue line. We have a history of being self-sacrificing. If you ask most Coasties why they join, they'll say the humanitarian mission. They'll say things like, I want to save lives. I want to help others. So after all our training and all the work, maybe sometimes a little hero does come out, but I don't think anybody actually calls themselves one. To our shipmates who sail into the storm, charge at danger, and are there for us during and after every disaster, we salute you. United States Coast Guard. These men are known that when people are pulling out to get away from hurricanes, they're known for going in. These are men that have wives and children, and I want every pastor's wife, disciple's wife, to listen to me very clearly. They understand their husband's calling, and some of them choose not to accept it. They understand what they are giving their lives to, and the wives understand it too. Listen to me. There are some of those men that the wives will leave them because they don't want to deal with it. And it places a bigger burden. There are men in the ministry. There are disciples here. Listen, you do everything you can to pull your husband away from discipleship. You do everything you can to, to make it more miserable. You, you don't help with the burden. You place some of the burden. As he's trying to hold his post, as he's trying to save so that others will live, here is the companion. Here is the friendship that is being windled down by complaints and accusations, nitpicking, pettiness, So that others may live. We're known to send out our very best. And let me explain to you why we send out our best. If you look through every branch of, 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 of military, of uh, Coast Guard, they train, they're called the elite for a reason. It's because they will deny their bodies till they can't go no more. Not everybody can do that. Otherwise, everybody would be special forces. They are the very best for a reason. Let me ask you this question. If you were involved in an accident and your child was injured, don't tell me you wouldn't want the best. If your spouse was affected, don't tell me you wouldn't want the best. My dad had a heart attack. I wanted the best. Yet we'll come into the house of God and we'll argue. Selfishness will always turn to yourself. We send out our best. And to the disciples in this place, I want you to listen to me. It's not a game. It's not a cliche. We need the best. You know what that means? You know, we, we, we say this, right? You can, you can you look at his stuff. Does he dress like pastor? Does he, act, does he preach like pastor? No, 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 no. It's their personal commitment to salvation that matters. Listen, uh, so what? You can walk like him. So what? You can preach like him. You know, we saw Brother James. You know, he had no ties with my dad other than my brother Adam. Amen. Uh, and he's up here doing a shuffle. You know what I'm talking about? Hey, listen. That's a blessing of inheritance, amen. That's not what qualifies the best. It's their personal commitment to love people, to care for the ones that would sacrifice themselves so that they could live. And that's what Jesus is talking to these men about. He's saying, listen, I'm dying for you, and you're going to rebuke me about what? Get thee behind me, Satan. It's so that others may live. 
to every pioneer work. You're struggling. You're frustrated. We, we've heard it preached. Listen to me. I understand nobody doesn't in this place. There's not a person exempt from trials. There's a reason why you're out there because there's a trust that you're the best. And it's not for you. It's so that others may live. To the pastor's wives, you're a part of that best. And I, I can't stress this enough. Your encouragement is an assistance to take the next step. Not the weight, not the added pressure. You're not going to see what that man sees. God has placed that calling in his life for a purpose. I don't care what the world preaches. You have to understand that there is trust that he is the best. And he's in that city for people. So that others may live. I was going to do a visible illustration. But I was so touched this week by just one simple, he's not here today. And many years ago, 1986, my father said yes to go and pioneer a church in Chico, California. I don't know if it was 86 or before that when he went, but in 1986, a young teenage boy at the age of 15 years old got saved. And that young boy's name was Eric Young. He was at Harvesters the last two days. This young boy is now, you know, 86, I don't know, I don't even know how he's in his 50s, maybe. I was about eight years old or so, and, and you know, in fact, one of the references is that my pastor Adam was, was a baby. He was, I don't even know, maybe two years old. And this brother, you know, we'd go, we'd go walking him to the park. We'd go with him to the park. He's a new convert to different times back then. Amen. But uh, he would go to the park, and, and he would pick up my brother Adam, put him on his shoulders like this, right? And he would walk with him. You know, Adam's only two years old. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, he's a young teenage boy. And last night, we, we took a picture, family picture. And, and it just brought my mind. Guess, guess what he did? He put Pastor Adam on his shoulders. With mine and my brother's assistance, I mean, that's a whole lot of man right there. <laughs> but I want you to think about this for a moment. Who would have ever thought, you know, whether he, he backslid, I don't know his entire story. Who would have ever thought that he would wind up in a church from a grandbaby preacher? in the same ministry of Pastor Saavedra in a totally different state. <laughs> so that others may live. I'll lay down my life. I'll lay down my pettiness. I don't need the limelight. I want to see the best for my men. I want to see the explosion of revival. I want to see couples restored. I want to hear new preachers. Because of men that are willing to say, hey, I'll lay down my life. Stop destroying your church. Don't let the devil inspire you to kill the body. Those are your brothers. and They may not be perfect because you sure ain't. God has called you to love with his love. It hurts me to see people that had a passion and a love for God that would, would weather the storms and then all of a sudden get turned in their hearts to where all they view is a pettiness. God, that's not who they were. Submit to God and say, God, you've had mercy on my life. 
And I want to lay it down so that others may live. Every head bowed tonight and every eye closed. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed this evening, no one's looking around for just a few moments. We heard Pastor Mike minister on holding your ground and making a stand to, to be in your place, whatever capacity that may be. Pastor Sean, as he ministered, if you can do the worst damage, your salvation is personal. Listen, your choice to make righteous decisions, that's on you. What are you going to do? God has spoken to you right now, this week. What are you going to do? And maybe God has met with you tonight, or this morning rather, on laying your life down so that others may live. You're sitting here in this place. Maybe you're not saved. You're not right with God. I want you to listen to me for a few brief moments. Jesus loved you so much that even there in our text, in that moment, he was able to recognize the influence of Satan. Why? Because he was thinking about you. His love says that I want to meet them. In June of 2022, at an Amarillo Harvesters Conference, and I want to rescue their life. And you're here this morning, I don't care what your life comes from, what you've done. Jesus loves you and he wants to help you. Sin will kill you, it will destroy you. It's inevitable, you cannot conquer sin only through Jesus Christ. And if you want to hear me out, I can tell you, you can trust God and he will never leave you nor forsake you. He can heal you, he can save you. He can mend you. He can restore your life. But it has to be your choice that would say, I accept him. And if that's you, I wonder if you'd slip your hand up and say, Pastor, can you pray for me? I'm not saved. But I want to give my life to Jesus this morning. I need God to help me. If you're not saved all throughout this place. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. If you want Jesus, come into your life. Would you slip it up so I can see it? Hi, so I can see it here this morning. Backslidden. You're backslidden. I don't care if you've sat in church for 20 years. But you have wandered from the faith. You, you have, you've accepted doctrines of demons that says you're okay when you know you're living in compromise. You're living in sin. You're twisted. Your attitude reflects that. Your choices reflect that. And the love of God is trying to rescue you right now. And all you have to do is be honest and say, God, I need you to help me. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? God sees that hand. Anybody else? You'll join this honest hearts. God sees that hand. You can put it back down. Any others? God sees these hands. Any others? Backslidden. You know that. Listen, don't, who cares what people say? God wants to heal you. God wants to help you. Any others? God sees this hand. Any others? His heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You raised your hand here this morning. You would do me a favor if you'd stand up right where you are. Come meet me here in the front. We're going to say a prayer with you. Appreciate your honesty here this morning. If I can have a brother, I'll lead him in a prayer. Thank you, my brother. Can I have a sister come lead her in a prayer? Appreciate your honesty. Young children here, amen. I need someone to pray with you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for your honesty. I need someone to pray with you. Saints of God, I want to appeal to you for just a moment. We've heard sermons all this week, and God has met, God has touched. There are brothers in this place, my pastor brothers, that listen, we have a brotherhood, we have a friendship, and can I, can I just challenge you to please, don't neglect your brothers. That friendship is needed. Don't, don't, don't make the ministry heavy upon them when they're just trying to do what you're doing. Work together. To the brethren in the congregation, listen to me. Strength comes in unity. Three strands are not easily broken. 
God is speaking to you. I, I told you about that brother in our church. He was given the privilege of having a donor, someone that was willing to give so that he may live. And he gets a call and says, Pastor, I'm on my way uh, to South Texas. Uh, someone has, is, is, uh, there's, a, there's a kidney available. Uh, and as he gets there, uh, amen, uh, this transplant occurs and immediately his body accepts it. Life is given to him and he's here with us today. Someone gave so that he could live. And because he's alive, he, told, he tells his doctor, as she says, listen, listen to me. Not very many people, I'm a doctor, not very many people make this list. And she's, she's, she's pretty much begging him. She's telling him, please do something with your life. What are you going to do? And this brother looks and says, I'm going to preach. And here is a doctor that's not saved, that is excited because of the understanding, simple understanding, so that others may live. Listen, church is so that others can live, not just the sinner, but each other. Helping in the times of struggle and trial. And I know that God is dealing with every church member in this place, that there are things, you're involved with pettiness, you're involved with compromises. And listen to me, it's a hindrance and God doesn't like it. That is not a Christian. It can very well stop you from heaven. And God is dealing with you right now. I want to challenge you to come to these altars and to lay hold of God and to say, God, forgive me. Not, not God, help me to deal with that brother. No, no, no. God, forgive me. Because your love says we do this anyway. We do this regardless. That's your love. I refuse to let them change who I am, whatever the case may be. God, I want to stand my ground in what you say is love. My heart is in you are faithful. Oh, and a hope that is real. Thankful, I pour out my heart to say to 
Let's give God praise here this morning. Father, we love you, God. We praise you, Jesus. Father, we need you. The meanness and the cruelty can destroy a church. The love of Christ is the need meeting ministry in every aspect, church, in every aspect. And that's why I felt it important to say, not only to the sinner, because I think we all know the sinner needs Jesus. But it's also for the brethren. That my brother on the other side of the church needs my encouragement for the tough times of his life. My sister in that other side of the church may need the encouragement of another sister that, that has just lost a relative and, and their faith is shattered and, and, and life is hammering them down and, and, and the worst thing they do is come into the house of God and the brotherhood is killing itself. So others may live will always be selfless, self-sacrificing. Ficing. And I'm going to ask you Please take this to heart and apply it to your life in a personal way. It's not words of encouragement or righteous stands. It'll help. It'll help. It's not uplifting. And trust me, it'll help. God's church will flourish. Amen? You come tonight, amen. Let's give God a clap offering as the pastor comes. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, almighty God. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Go ahead and fill up your cup this morning. You need to go buy a new cup because it's got a hole in it. Hallelujah. Don't forget... The prayer at 6 o'clock. Be here for prayer. Ready to pray. Amen. Pastor Teshman will be here at 7 o'clock. He's going to bring the glory. Amen. We're going to go ahead and close this morning in prayer. Be careful going home. Be careful as you're out there eating. Remember, we are a testimony for the Amarillo Church as we're in restaurants or different places. Amen. Let's just stay saved. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and close. Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning. Father, we thank you for your words, God of encouragement. Father, God of